Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us this Thursday evening. My name is Erin Cristobal. I'm the Associate Curator at the Hammer Museum. And I'm so excited to introduce this program and to celebrate the launch of Jasmine Hernandez's new book, We Are Here, Visionaries of Color Transforming the Art World. We Are Here features 50 influential BIPOC artists and cultural producers from New York to Los Angeles and beyond. who are shifting the art world and features interviews and gives an intimate look into everyone's offices, studios, and workspaces. I've known Jasmine for a few years now and was first introduced to her work through her innovative platform and site, Gallery Girls. And the site has been highlighting folks of color in the art world for many years with a focus on femme and queer artists, curators, and gallerists. Jasmine continues to be an important voice in the larger global art world and creates a space in which we can make meaningful diasporic and cultural connections between artists and artistic networks in ways that we honor and uplift black and brown cultural producers. Um, I was so excited to be featured in We Are Here and I'm so glad that this book has manifested um, into an archive really of the ecosystems and communities that continue to propel this art world forward in a future that is dynamic, multivalent and diverse in the truest sense. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce this program. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Jasmine, Essence Hardin, Genevieve Gaynard, and Patrick Martinez, who are all featured in the book. Um, I also wanted to note that this book is featured in the Hammer Bookstore and also on the Hammer Bookstore site. Um, so feel free to pick it up. It's a really incredible book with these really gorgeous spreads of everyone who's featured. Um, I'm just gonna read off some bios really quickly and then I'm actually gonna hand it over to Jasmine who's gonna moderate a conversation between Essence, Genevieve and Patrick. And then we're gonna open it up for questions. So thank you. Um, Jasmine Hernandez is the founder and editor in chief of Gallery Girls. Her writing has appeared in Harper's Bazaar, Paper, Bustle, Elle, The Cut, Artnet, and more. She is a native New Yorker born to Dominican parents based in Harlem, New York City. Um, and to learn more about Gall Gallery Girls, go to gallerygirls.net and follow at Gallery Girls, and that's girls with a U. Essence Hardin is an independent curator and arts writer. Essence has curated exhibitions at the California African American Museum, the Museum of African Diaspora, the Oakland Museum of California, and UTA Artist Space, amongst others. Essence has contributed to several publications, including Art 21, Cultured Magazine, Contemporary Art Review Los Angeles, La La Magazine, Sense, and has written catalog entries for Prospect 5, um, Haley, uh, What Needs to be Said, Haley Ford Fellows in the Visual Arts. Additionally, Essence is a recipient of the Creative Capital and Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant and is an Annenberg Innovation Lab Civic Media Fellow. Genevieve Gaynard is a Los Angeles-based artist whose work focuses on installation, sculpture, and photographic self-portraiture to explore race, femininity, and class. As a biracial woman in America, Gaynard investigates the aesthetics and cultural divide between black and white, a chasm as palpable as it is invisible. She interrogates notions of passing by positioning her own female body as a chief site of exploration, challenging viewers to navigate the powers and anxieties of intersectional identity. Her work has been included in numerous solo and group exhibitions, including the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, Crystal Bridges Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the California African American Museum, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, Prospect 4, um, and 
Gaynard received her BFA in photography from Massachusetts College of Art and Design, Boston, MA, and her MFA in photography from Yale University. And we can actually pull up the cover of the book. I'm just gonna continue reading. Um, Patrick Martinez, one second, thank you. Patrick Martinez maintains a diverse practice that includes mixed media landscape paintings, neon sign pieces, cake paintings, and his peachy series of appropriative works. Martinez earned his BFA with honors from Art Center College of Design in 2005. His work has been exhibited domestically and internationally in LA, Mexico City, San Francisco, Minneapolis, Miami, New York, Seoul, and the Netherlands. Um, Patrick's work resides in the permanent collections of LACMA, the Smithsonian of African American History and Culture, Culture the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art, Tucson Museum of Art, the Crocker Art Museum, Cornell Fine Art Museum, um, amongst others. Patrick was awarded a Rauschenberg residency on Captiva Island, Florida to, com to be completed in 2021. And also in the fall of 2021, Patrick will be the subject of a solo museum exhibition at the Tucson Museum of Art. Patrick lives and works in Los Angeles and is represented by Charlie James Gallery. Los Angeles. So that's everyone. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Jasmine. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Weird. Hi, everyone. Weird. Why am I not coming in? We can hear you, Jasmine. Oh, okay. I'm just not visible. Okay. Oh, we can see you too. Oh, amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been off Zoom for like a month. Uh, thank you for that really, oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> amazing. Um, thank you, Erin, for that really lovely introduction. Um, thank you, Janani and, and all the Hammer team for just incredible, your incredible support and in putting this event together. Um, my tour would not be complete without having a dedicated LA tour, a LA virtual event. Um, with LA folks at a dedicated LA institution and having a dedicated LA conversation. Um, I'm immensely proud that Erin is included, Essence is included, Genevieve, uh, Patrick, and all the other you know, fantastic um, LA folks, Jalen Gomez, Rick Garcon, um, Gabriela Sanchez, Kentura Davis, Naima J. Keith, and I feel like I'm forgetting someone else. Mm. I feel like I'm forgetting someone else. Uzumaki. And, and Uzumaki Cepeda, yes, yes, yes. Um, it was absolutely pivotal and necessary that, that LA Art Voices would be included in this book. Uh, we Are Here is basically Gallery Girls in Print. Um, it's a universal, non-academic, non-scholarly voice, uh, open and universal and frank for anyone at any art level to just jump into. Um, I'm presenting 50 narratives and 50 blueprints um, of how you can navigate the art world out at your level, at your speed. Everyone's story is valid and phenomenal and amazing. Everyone made it on their own terms unapologetically and those stories have to be highlighted. Um, this is an absolute privilege. Um, I'm happy to be a person that um, I guess not collected these voices, but included these voices. Uh, I, you know, I'm not a privileged white art writer that was handed a, you know, that was handed a book deal and, you know, it's a compendium of like white contemporary artists and I threw in a few minorities. This is a forest bias endeavor. So this is a black, you know, Afro-Dominican woman from New York who doesn't have a graduate degree in visual arts criticism, who just devours art on a weekly basis all around the city. Um, and speaks in a very authentic and passionate way. Um, so it was vital to include everyone um, as they are in, in their myriad ways of, of art making and art production. It was important to include artists and art makers. Um, art, art cultural workers get, help the artists get their art out into the world as well. So it was, it was important to include folks like Joanna Bolivar Samuels, Danny Baez, Lario Se Mensa, Legacy Russell, et cetera. Um, New York and LA voices were just obvious to include. Um, it's an intergenerational group of folks. So you have veteran artists like Renee Cox and Lola Flash, 
down to folks like Katie Pebanito and Uzumaki Cepeda who are still under 27. So there's just a range of just so many stories. And there are folks that are PhD candidates, have an MFA and a BFA, just have a BFA, have some college, have zero college. Um, everyone made it on their own terms. Um, and it's just phenom phenomenal to see that. Everyone in the book is impacting the world in some way. Um, whether it's seeing Derek Adams work on Insecure, where you know Issa and the girls go go to CAM, the California African American Museum, and Derek's work, you know, is is is, is the exhibit, and that you know you're literally seeing it in HBO, or it's Genevieve showing up in Vogue, or Lucia Yero being you know being featured in Vogue. Um, all of you are impacting global, you know, pop culture globally. Um, so I, I saw that. I, I just saw those phenomenal changes and it was just time, it was just simply time for it to be documented. Um, again, it, it's, a, it's a book that anyone can just kind of just step into. Um, in a way the book has been maybe therapeutic because you know, it, it kind of came out during lockdown and you know, maybe institutions were closed and these could just be 50 studio visits that you access you know, from your bookshelf at your pace, you know, at your flow, um, and just let everyone's words, you know, just speak to you. There were just so many gems that were just unearthed and all of the questions. I kept all the questions very universal. I didn't focus on trauma. I, I focused on joy. I focused on abundance. I focused on just everyday pleasures um, that make you happy, that propel you to keep working. Um, so that was very important to me. It was important, of course, to everyone, of course, you know, it's, it's a compendium of black and brown artists and, and, and cultural workers, um, but black folks are centered, you know, 100%. So black folks are the largest group with black women being the largest group. Um, that was just a no brainer for me as an Afro-Dominican woman. Um, it was also important to showcase, you know, QTB, IPOC folks, not just cis queer folks, but trans and non-binary folks as well. Um, so again, that, that was just um, a very obvious inclusion. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of it. Um, it, it, you know, I worked on it for so long. It just felt like it was never gonna, going to come out, but, um, it came out when it did, you know, and when it should have, when the world needed it. And, um, yeah, I'm happy to just, to, to just dive in and just uh, have a more robust conversation. Great. So I have a few, um, I have group questions for everyone and then I have pinpointed questions for everyone else. So I guess my first question is, what has brought you joy this week? And we'll, we can start with uh, Essence. Hi. Hi, and Patrick and Genevieve, feel free to turn on your videos now. Hi. Thank you. I'm gonna go. Ooh, what's brought me joy this week? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, Art-wise, man, there's so much good stuff out there. I've had like four studio visits this week and that's been really fantastic because it's been a while, you know? Like I, I had a show open at the beginning of the year, but having studio visits again, it's been really fun, exciting, and just talking to folks through ideas, through different theories for upcoming exhibitions. That's been pretty exciting. I also actually like looked through my inbox and like actually mapped out the rest of my year which doesn't sound like it would be fun, but it was fun <laughs> because it like released from my mind and then I could see it all. And I was like, oh, I have like a lot of stuff going on uh, for the rest of the year and for 2022 and 2023. So very boring, but I did enjoy Not it. Not boring, <laughs> joyful. <laughs> Maybe it's a sense of like, but does this feel like a sense of normalcy? Like, oh, I'm back out again, seeing art and. Yeah, yes I think and so. No. Yeah, I definitely think yeah. so. Like, yeah, I've got like a little 13 month old kid and she's super fun and a, a good spirit. And it's fun like taking her to shows and exhibitions and um, kind of what I imagined my life would be like. So yeah, I guess like the studio visits, the like looking at the calendar, that's starting to make more sense. Right, right. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, we can continue with Pat. Oh, did you have more to add? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can continue with Patrick. <laughs> I think um, I've been working lots, you know, like I've been in the studio a lot. So um, when I can get away and I did get away today, it's like just like um, stuff with friends getting together. We were just playing basketball just now, even like getting away and like clearing my mind, um, riding my bike. 
so I've been riding my bike, um, you know, when the pandemic kind of hit, it was like trying to figure out other ways to like, kind of like work out. It was kind of like the, the counter to my studio. Cause if you're, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just something I need to do to like, um, not feel stagnant and just like kind of get my blood going. So yes. it's been that it's been like getting out, getting sun, um, even though like I have a mask on, like trying to, uh, navigate, um, I don't know, getting like my blood going and like, you know, sweating a little bit and then seeing friends and riding bikes with them and playing basketball with them. And that, that brings me joy right now. And um, it's been like that for a few weeks. So I look Beautiful. forward to that. Look forward to that. Beautiful. Is Genevieve? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, amazing. <laughs> hey, um, honestly, like I'm in Massachusetts right now. So like looking forward to like seeing you all has been like a highlight of my week and so it's just nice to see you guys and this is my you know my LA family yes <laughs> beautiful um can you share forms of, of self-care that carried you throughout 2021 into 20 2020 into 2021 can you share forms of self-care that carried you throughout 2020 into 2021 it might be it's a larger extension of the first question in a way but we can start with the uh, essence. Uh, Mezcal, uh, natural wine, <laughs> uh -huh. taking a bath, taking a bath, <laughs> going to the chiropractor. Uh, I mean, I'm a Taurus. I really, uh, I go deep and making the body feel good. Um, <laughs> so yes. I love all that. Um, going to acupuncture. And I think, you know, I go to bed pretty early. I go to bed at like 10 o'clock and I wake up fairly early at like six, but I like to sleep like eight hours, you know? I have my little coffee when I wake up. I've got my little rituals, but I think those things, I mean, yeah, I'm a lush, I should say. So I, I love, love it. it. The self-indulgement, I love it. Yes. <laughs> um, Patrick? Yeah, I think it's just the stuff that I had mentioned before. When I can, it's it's like a weird thing because you get involved with all this stuff, but it's super boring. Like it's just like random stuff that like you try to figure out ways to do with your friends. But self care, um, going to LA River and riding my bike, clearing my mind. Um, that was that's like really therapeutic for me, especially when I ride alone. I just get it in, and then also um, you know. When things kind of, kind of like numbers went down, I, I got a massage, you know, um, that was cool. Um, I don't know, like it's, it's like also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like just, just uh, bits and pieces of things that we used to do that yeah. kind of like mean so much now. Um, so things like that, ordering in food or something like a restaurant that you really like on a Friday, having a drink, trying to, you know, um, celebrate the week or just kind of, you know, retreat back into the weekend. Yeah. Beautiful. Genevieve? I would say going on kind of long walks and just being out in nature. Since I've been out in Massachusetts for a while, I'm kind of just in the woods. So it's pretty peaceful. Um, but just, you know, learning how to do my own nails <laughs> things that I like were like always did and then but relied on someone else to do that for me I'm still gonna go back to having someone do it because trust the professionals but <laughs> um and then just like being still because I think a lot of us are mm. constantly like before the pandemic it's like it's just constant uh -huh. it's go 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 and you know it's it's just like the it's been at least a time to just kind of be still and just kind of gather your thoughts and make sense of make sense of it all, I guess. I, I still plan on practicing stillness because the, there's this like, there's this like subliminal pressure, like the world is opening back up, go back out, produce, produce, produce. So I'm going to continue practicing stillness no matter what. I'm not going back to the hamster on a wheel <laughs> type level, capitalistic type production. It just, that didn't work. Yeah. Um, my next question is, how does the LA art community hold you down and lift you up? 
specifically the BIPOC our community? We can start with Essence. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I moved here like six years ago and I'm from Oakland, California, which is like in the Bay Area. Um, and from the get, it's like, I met Aaron, I met Lauren Halsley, I met uh, my friend Sadie from high school, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Sadie Barnett? Yeah, Sadie oh, Barnett. You went to high school together, oh wow. Yeah, so I've known Sadie since I was a teenager, but all these people, Naima, like folks really came through immediately and it was a career change for me. I was, you know, at UC Berkeley doing my PhD um, and I'm on like leave whatever right now, but I would say that like having that kind of um, entry point of just deep support where everyone was so kind and generous and my conversations were so generative. And so that has remained true, you know, throughout like my six years here, you know, like I had a show at UTA Artist Space that opened in February, yeah. um, kind of delayed for hell of long because of you know COVID and Arthur Lewis, who essentially runs the space, you know, like gave me that opportunity. And I would say that every opportunity I've had here um, has been because a black or a brown person has seen me and wanted to extend you know what they had on the table so that I could also like you know exist in the realm. And then mm -hmm. of course everyone who came through, all the support and love is like. Those are my people, like Jen came, like, it's just, it's, I don't know, it's immense. Like, I wouldn't have any notion of Los Angeles without all the black and brown people who have made it possible for me to be here and live here and live here. Like, I moved in the middle of the pandemic and I live in like a friend's parents building randomly, but I just, I'm like, everything I do here is always because I know someone else. And yes. I'm so, so kind um, and my career feels at the level that it is and my thoughts feel um, as deep and as um, fully formed and complicated by virtue of these connections and these conversations that I'm continually having. So folks hold me down like on the daily. I mean, it's like, it's nonstop over here for me. So I, yeah. <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah. Patrick? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, been, it's been a minute, right? So I've, I've been here in LA um, grew up in San Gabriel Valley, but it's it's been fun watching um, it, like you know, like black and brown, like uh, develop, like that community and visual arts and um, develop, and in you know, in, in in an organic way. And it was not always like this, you know, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. so, um, it's much needed. It's something that I needed um, to be, you know, um, around a part of. Um, I felt, you know, early on, very isolated with just like trying to figure out and navigate galleries and like um, scratching my head and like figuring out like, um, because, you know, it's it is, at the end of the day, it is a space where they're selling art. And so any, you know, like that, that's not really why I was wanting to be involved. And it was kind of like a more autotelic kind of situation for me. I was just making things and uh, of course, wanting to, you know, get them seen but it was just nothing uh, right away that was kind of like reflecting or like kind of speaking to. Um, so a lot of the people that are, you know, making noise now, they were fighting and, you know, we were just kind of like wanting to show our work and fighting for that space. And now that um, we're getting a, you know, people are getting a little bit more attention. It's, it's good to see, and it's good to see people kind of supporting each other. And I try to do as much as I can to support Los Angeles based artists, because for one, it's like, you know, I know how hard it is just to be a visual artist in this country. And then for two, it's like, um, I, get, I can relate, you know, and, and uh, when we do connect, uh, whether it's for a drink or, you know what I mean, just like running into people in LA um, or just at a show, uh, you know, trying to break bread is important for me. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's, um, I'm also kind of shy, you know, at the, you know, at the beginning. So it was just kind of like a, it was one of those things where, where I had to open up from, I mean, myself I have to open up and I still kind of am just kind of uh, reserved more, more reserved. So, um, but I think I got it to a point where it's like, um, I like to, um, you know, uh, break bread with uh, other LA artists and I like to see them. I, I enjoy seeing their work develop. And I think there's room out here in LA for art to grow. I mean, you know, 
you know, for, for artists to experiment. And I, I like to see it and I like to encourage it and I try to help out in any way I can. I love the camaraderie with the Charlie James squad because Jaylin, yourself and Gabriella, like that love is so real. Um, that sync, that artistic uh, synchronicity. Um, I know, you know, yeah. it's, 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 flu it's fluid, it's beautiful. You know, I haven't even met Gabriella yet. I've met you a few times. I haven't even met Jay Lynn yet. Um, but it didn't, it didn't stop me from approaching each of you to be in the book because I, again, just that camaraderie, it just like it spilled off like my phone screen. Like it just, that love and that synchronicity. I, I just, I love that. Yeah, I met, three of you. Yeah, I met Jay Lynn uh, back in 2008, 2009. So it was like, uh, you know, we we're trying to figure things out and we were, we would message, message each other about like work that we were working on and, trying to figure out, uh, you know, just scratching our heads, like trying to figure things out. And um, it's good to see development and like things get taken to whatever level they get taken at. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Genevieve? Yeah, I moved out to LA about six years ago as well. And so that first year I had no idea like what I was doing and I didn't really know anybody. I too was pretty shy and um, it was like slowly kind of going to openings and like people coming to my openings and just like slowly the, the crew kind of like built, you know, and just to kind of see it, see us all kind of growing and like feeding off each other and, you know, we're able to reach out to each other for advice and just kind of passing that down to each other I think is a pretty special part of you know the uplifting side of being in LA um, but there is I think at least for me this feeling of always having to be on when mm. you're there you know, like and I think that's stopped and I, I kind of mentioned that kind of having that pause have that moment of just kind of still with within um, which has been nice but I'm, you know, I've kind of, I'm kind of like, I've been still for a minute. I'm ready to kind of get back out there and, um, you know, just really feed off the energy of everyone else's mm -hmm. new work. I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of things, special things of that course. have been brewing, you know, behind the scenes. Yeah. And so I got nothing but love for, you know, like even like the not so exciting things are like a push, you know, and it's, it's just like always, um, just, you know, it's like a team effort kind of vibe there. It really is a team effort, yeah. Um, great. So now I have like a few specific questions, two or three for each of you, and I'll start off with Essence. Um, we can pull up slide two. And it's gonna be a slide of the most recent exhibit that you curated, Sites of Memory at UTA Artist Space. Um, I think it ended last month in early March. And the exhibit was inspired by a Toni Morrison essay called The Sight of Memory. And it's a nuanced group show featuring artists like John Rivers, J Geniva Ellis, Basil Kincaid, Pamela Council, et cetera, all working across rich mediums. So my question to you, Essence, is how did you gather ideas of memories, imagination, and future building, and inject that into the, into the exhibit? Ooh, fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. <It's> a mouthful. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I think the exhibition sort of for me, and maybe the way that I work in general is that I'm always reading. And then, you know, I have like a list or many a list of people that I want to work with, right? And so Pamela Council is someone who was like, I want to do this with Pamela. I'm reading this Toni Morrison essay. I'm kind of interested in sort of mem less, less memory and more of like the desire and want and need to remember as like a sort of interesting space of creating work from. And so kind of building off of those two sites, right, of like, you know, Toni Morrison and Pamela, I kind of built out and I made a, an exhibition in that regard. Um, I really wanted the work to kind of flow, you know, outside of the States. And so Anique Jordan, her photographs are in the exhibition. Um, she's from Canada, she's Trinidadian. 
And then I have a Paul Gideon whose work is, you can see here, um, it's like the two, the three blue people um, and he's from Accra, Ghana. And so I think, you know, in part it's sort of working through artists or working with artists who are working through these themes kind of at large um, and then using those conversations to like, you know, kind of build out an exhibition space from, right? And so like Noel's work, and there was two Noel pieces in there, and you can see one of them, the Hood Dreams one, that's behind the Gideon piece. Um, but Noel had these works already kind of completed, right? And I was like, your investment in, you know, black representation and like the kind of impossibility that it structures it. And so how do you kind of um, point not only to that impossibility, but also sort of re-manipulate um, and tear apart and degrade um, what is already like uh, unseen. And so like memory becomes this kind of evasive space for him. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it's a lot of that. It's a lot of working with people who I think are kind of like in line with what I'm like trying to get at in that particular exhibition and really framing something less as like, you know, this is a, a Toni Morrison essay that then is becoming an exhibition more of like, this question that Toni Morrison brings up around genre um, and you know the possibilities with memory seems like an interesting enough subject to kind of uh, I don't know disentangle that there's a desire in in humans to 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 remember and that desire can create this kind of host of things with people thinking about their family archive thinking about their own self like Geneva's uh, two portraits that are in the exhibition um, Basil and um, John and Lipo Hang and A.D. Roberson all thinking about the family archive or, you know, and Nick thinking about the historical archive of sort of blackness or anti-blackness in Canada. And then Musée Cissé thinking about uh, sort of city and placement and displacement when it comes to like urban spaces, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's super rich. Um, Josephine, if you can just, um, if we can present slide three through eight, just Kind of quickly just yeah mm -hmm. skip through just yes. so we can give folks Don't a sense know. of the whole show yeah Neva, uh, noel basil yeah i think that like i wanted the texture i wanted every angle to kind of hit you know like i wanted to be like bam like every time you were like looking at something <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> we see that yeah and to feel like the difference of each artist's position and work um and yeah, like 80s piece, which is, uh, you know, a screen print on wood. And it's these archive photos of her grandmother who's Jamaican in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And this sort of, you know, manipulation of colors and everything gets sort of um, abstracted quite a bit. And 80 kind of works in abstraction anyway. And I really wanted a representation of like abstract works as well, right? Like there is um, a heavy focus on portraiture and I think it's important. And I also think that there's ways that we can kind of, you know, have a little more spirit when it comes to thinking through imaging blackness or imaging, you know, self. Um, yeah, Apa Gideon's thinking through fantasy and sort of folklore that he's grown up with. Um, and a lot of his work before this was, uh, you know, like a, about his family in like a very direct way, like his grandmother is, or his father or whatever. And this work is like thinking of like the folklore and the traditions around like, creating narratives around family, you know, like desire for places that are not yet here. Uh, and I saw his work when I was in um, Ghana. God knows when now. I just remember that, so. <laughs> Two years ago, pre-pandemic. But yeah, like I, I, I love curating because it kind of allows for all the, you know, the kind of scholarship that Berkeley taught me and my program taught me and like Lee Rafer taught me to kind of have this, you know, creative outlet and to really guide um, a curatorial practice where like deep research is important. And also there's this way that I, I love, I get to curate, you know, exhibitions with all black people or mostly black people or, you know, like I get to do what I want. And mm -hmm. I find that difficult to have an exhibition that isn't, um, super white or something, you know, like, or to not have an exhibition even that's about people being black. And it's just like, these are black people and they're together and they're making, no, I don't need to do like, that. Like, all right. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's like, if you're thinking through 
if you have, if you allow yourself the scholarship, if you allow yourself the capacity to kind of run on in your mind, I think that you can give people a fair amount of justice and give yourself some justice when it comes to thinking critically about someone's art practice and their work. Um, and so that's what I try to do. And I think this will, that's what this exhibition did. Amazing. I wish I would have seen it. Um, I have one more question for you. <laughs> uh, we can have one more question for you. Um, let's see. Oh, so I consider you to be like, kind of like the part of the DNA and the lifeline, the pulse of like Black Art, Los, like black, uh, um, black Art Los Angeles. So you've curated shows, you know, at Residency Art with mappings, you know, Plum Line and Refuge at CAM, you know, Black is a Color at Charlie James. I, and I asked you in the book and I asked many folks in the book, like, when did you know that you finally made it? And part of your answer, and I'm paraphrasing here was, I know I'm on the right path just due to the incredible support Yes, it is art. Yes, it is Cali. Yes, it is scholarship. And yes, storytelling is the means by which I do this. So my question to you is what propels you to continue storytelling and curating with a black focus? And it, it, it seems like a simplistic question, but I just, I know you'll add richness to this. Well, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, shit. Um, I think, yes, that. <laughs> I, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I try with the cursing. It's really hard for me for some reason. But anyways, uh, right path. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that it just feels so generative in my life. Like every time I'm like, I don't know, am I doing the right thing? Does this make sense? Like, what should I, you know, is there something else for me? And I, and I imagine there's many things I could do. I like lots of stuff. So it's not that deep to imagine. But I, I just feel the energy. I feel like the yeah. love and I feel good at the end of the day. Like I go to bed feeling good. I love like, I love curating. I love talking to artists. I love being like um, a part of the ecosystem here. And I, and I love also just, yeah, like expanding my mind. And um, I am an extrovert, I guess. I didn't really realize that because I am not that shy. Patrick, Jen, I would say pretty shy people. <laughs> I will agree with them, but I am not that shy. <laughs> and I really miss people, man. Like I know everyone miss people during um, like really like deep quarantine, but like it feels so good to be out there and to be in a gallery space, to be in a museum space, to be doing studio visits. It just feels like a thing I know how to do and that I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, and like using my skill, which I have a, a general desire to be of use and to help. And I think this is something I can do because I think curating, you know, it's kind of a behind the scenes job, which I love. Mm -hmm. That's the part about it. I'm like, I can look raggedy. I don't have to do anything. Like I just gotta like be thoughtful and be smart and, you know, make, things make sense. Um, and so I don't envy artists and their and their jobs and their roles in this uh, at all, because it's mad hard. But what I do get to do is be like, all right, like we're gonna build a family together to whatever degree, you know, like to really take curating as a task of family building and to be, um, yeah, I guess of use, as I've said. So I, I still feel that way, like, it's 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 a trip. Like I'll I'll be tripped up about like oh I didn't get this thing or like it feels like shade like this didn't happen that didn't happen and I'm like yeah oh my god happening. at the end of the day like I feel like I feel pretty great and um, I think that's why how I know you know what I mean like I read something and I still have ideas like I'm never lacking <laughs> mm. and that makes me feel excited. I really feel that. Um, my next questions, my next few questions are for Genevieve and we can pull up um, slide, slide nine. And then we can also then transition to 10. Um, I love this image because it just says so, so much. And I can't wait to hear Genevieve's answer. So this is at Freeze LA in 2020, right before the pandemic. I believe it was February. And it's a really powerful image because it's you and Jeffrey Deitch in the same frame. The back of your dress says, sell to black collectors. And you're wearing a Telfar bag. <laughs> so this photo says a lot. It's old guard versus, versus new guard. 
and you're making explicit demands about black art collecting. So please tell me everything about this image. This is being recorded. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably won't tell you everything I was thinking. Um, right, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the dress was just an extension of the collage that I made. Um, and, you know, part of our cohort in LA is are are the the collectors that collect our work and you know host us and um are the patrons that you know just create space for us to kind of all hang out as as a community in their spaces and so through that a lot of us are sharing stories um about you know who gets access to certain things and to hear some of the black collectors say like they don't get access to certain things, um, you know, that was something I wanted to address just very bluntly, I guess. Um, the, the kind of idea, I, I, I was literally painting that dress like the night before the opening and everything. And just, I had the idea and I was just, kind of, I guess, took it to a more of a performative um, mm -hmm. place uh, by showing up on the opening day with that dress on. And, um, you know, I was mostly just in in Suzanne Vilmitter's booth. Um, I had a solo booth there. And so, you know, at one point, uh, my studio manager and I kind of strolled around and I kind of made a point to go into certain spaces um and have my picture taken and I don't even think Jeffrey was aware that I was even in his right space. I think he's even on his phone in that picture <laughs> so um yeah I think it was there was a piece that went up to auction so it felt like it got flipped it must have you know I think it was sold to a white collector not that black collectors don't flip things but I'm just you know there's kind of more of a conversation that happens and I think a lot of investing in like an artist's longevity so kind of not mm. um you know doing that to an artist's career in terms of um you know kind of knowing who you're selling the work to so that we can kind of be on this longer path of an art career um it's it can get slippery so i think i just wanted to address that specifically um without saying names of the artists and whatnot right well it speaks volumes um we can go to slide um 11. So this is an installation called People Make the World Go Around. And I wanna connect this piece with a quote um, that you have in the book where I asked you, I asked you about your installations and you said, um, installations can end up being less about me and more about the audience and their own conflicts. So I love this idea of people looking at each other and just the self-reflections that you get and you may not like what you see, but you have to work it out on your own. If you just had any thoughts about like your quote and then like this piece. Yeah, I think I'm, you know, my work stems from a very personal place, but I'm trying to um, affect change in a positive way. So um, when folks are kind of experiencing my work, um, I, I want to have moments where they can kind of come in and out of really seeing themselves in it and being able to kind of pause and, okay, this is maybe about the artist more than me. Um, but the, the use of the mirrors is kind of something that I think kind of is an easy way to like stop the viewer in their tracks to kind of, um, address the fact that the, the topics I'm addressing and the things I'm bringing up are not just about me. And I think mm -hmm. so often with any work, you know, you can kind of pick apart the psyche of the artist, but there's, you know, there's probably something to your own story that's involved in that as well, so. Yeah. We can go to slide 12. Um, 
Um, so viewers normally experience your installations indoors in art spaces, and it's very intimate, but with your public art project, and this was the public art project you have with Art Production Fund, I think September of 2020, mm -hmm. um, at Rockefeller Center in, in New York. Um, so with this public art project, you brought your work to the public, you know, during the pandemic. So can you talk about this other layer of your work being seen in public spaces? Yeah, this was kind of an exciting um, space to show it in because I think with the photography, it, I was thinking how it could kind of read like an advertisement for fashion mm -hmm. or something. So someone might not read it the way it's presented in the, like in an obvious way. Um, and sadly, again, it was during the pandemic. So a lot of people didn't get to experience it in the way that those halls are usually filled with people like yeah, going to work and whatnot. And it's kind of like a tourist stop on, you know, people visiting the city. And um, so, you know, it's great that it's been documented. And um, I did get a chance to go there. But again, New York felt like a ghost town because everyone was kind of staying indoors. But um, I think it still has that, um, it has that ability to kind of still have that read because when it's, re you know, documented and put out in the world, it kind of has that like further removed from its original context thing mm -hmm. that happens. Um, and I remember being in the space and I guess I'm kind of a chameleon people. I'm always shocked if someone like recognizes me. So like when I was standing in there, I think um, this one gentleman was waiting for his girlfriend in the bathroom and I was just standing there looking at the work and then he was all like turning to me and it was like, wait, is that you? And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, these are really blown up images. So seeing the work that large was really a trip and uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so Patrick, I have two quick questions for you. We can go to slide, um, slide 14. So your cake paintings are really playful and vibrant, but they still hold reverence and they honor past and living black and brown freedom fighters. Can you talk about deconstructing formal portraiture and using this whimsical approach? Absolutely. Um, so my approach with these, um, these cake paintings, um, they kind of started as taking the community kind of like sheet cake like for a birthday you know like if you're having a birthday and there's you know like the the, the family the community um you know your friends your the kids around the community have you know come for the birthday um they're kind of seeing it and it, you know everyone can relate because everyone has a birthday but i you know they, i'm speaking on like a specific sheet cake that has a print on it uh, edible kind of like portrait of the person you know that's having the birthday of uh, the person they're celebrating and then um, you know it could be like a childhood photo current photo things like that um, so I'm, I'm using that to celebrate uh, people i think that have been discounted in history um, that are specifically black and brown um, and just have been overlooked and I, and i wanted to paint um, them in you know kind of like a you know, referencing like European easel painting, right? Like it's not just, um, I'm trying to paint them in a different way. I'm, I'm using this kind of language that speaks to, um, or a technique that speaks to the tradition of America, right? And, but I'm flipping, I guess, like the presentation of it. And I, I kind of enjoy that. And um, it's not, uh, you know, a charoscuro dark back, uh, background where we're trying to pop highlights mm -hmm. It, it, it's like a neon pink or neon yellow, neon green. And it's like, I'm kind of the invert of something that's super dark and, you know, like typical portrait that you might find at the natural, you know, like in a historic kind of space a museum with a, um, you know, like an older white man with a black, you know, like a dark background, black. Mm -hmm. Um, oil, <laughs> yeah, oil. You know, like uh, it's it's totally like glistening because of the, the varnish, and then you have the gold frame. So um, I right. just 
can frame this uh, with, uh, you know, the, the cake platter that it comes in where you find cakes in a grocery store market. They come on a, in, in a, on a gold platter and I wanted to use that to frame. I'm using all the elements to create a new way of presenting portrait. Mm -hmm. This is an investigation on how to apply paint, you know, like different ways to apply paint, even where I'm taking heavy body acrylics and using them in a cake froster. Um, you know, uh, thinking about um, the way Wayne Tebow or Lucian Freud, mm -hmm. like flipping that and trying to use um, all that language, all that vocabulary that we've kind of seen, that I've seen when I was a kid in high school or like, you know, college, um, flip that and then, you know, and kind of like uh, subvert it. It's effective. Um, they're very touching. So I have one final question for you. This like team, and then I'll ask Russian for Patrick. I couldn't hear that last part. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just I'm waiting for slide 15. Josephine, oh, okay. if you can just we can just do slide 15, and then I have one more question for Patrick. Amazing. So your neon. This is from the group show at Albright Knox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Up now comes down in May. Um, and your neon sculptures, your neon sculptures are very blunt and they capture what marginalized black and brown folks are feeling in very few words. So in these relentless you know, news cycles, you're just um, how do you have the no continue with these works and with how do you continue with these works? Um, you mean like the you're, you're saying like, how, how do I, I didn't catch the last part, it was breaking up. Um, you're saying like, how do I continue to create? Oh. I, I just, yeah, so in these relentless news cycles that are full of trauma, like how do you push past all the noise and just continue like producing these works? Yeah, I mean, um, they started as like a reference to like, you know, storefront signage and referencing that and kind of like remixing that and, and just kind of using that as a thought bubble a rectangle with text that usually advertises like, you know, liquor store or income tax, laundry mat. So it, they're just thought bubbles for me. And some of the, the messages come from the past, you know, that I'm trying to make present. Um, and, um, you know, because they're still relevant and they still speak to this, you know, to this day and people need to see them. And that's really what it is. It's just kind of like, um, especially during the past, like, you know, the last uh, president's uh, four years, I mean, these things had to um, to be uh, kind of seen, I thought. Um, so, you know, I started the first couple, I think I did the first two in 2008. And I kind of, it started with kind of like them being playful and kind of being clever or whatever, and then developing them into speaking about like the recession and all these things. And then, the, you know, they just organically um, started, you um, evolving into um, speaking, you know, truth to power, speaking to the current, you know, at that time, the current presidency. And then just, you know, um, they almost kind of developed kind of organically um, on social media as a yeah. protest sign, a digital protest sign. So people would copy and paste like, or, you know, post my, cause it's like the right format for it. So, I just fed off of that. I just fed off that people were using it. And like Essence was saying earlier, like, I want to be useful too. You know, like, I don't want to just decorate people's homes. I want to, mm -hmm. you know, this is the way I speak. You know, I, like I said before, I'm, you know, as a kid, I was very shy and this is the way I communicate uh, the visual. Um, so it's just something that I never really uh, get tired of. Yeah. There's tough days and you, you know, like, it's just like, like anything, but you know, um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm um, excited to do it. I feel good about it. Um, so I continue. I feel excited about new things that I'm putting, you know, that I feel like, oh, that, that seems like that might be, that might hit or like I feel like good about it or that needs to be seen. So put it out like, yeah, I feel good, I feel fresh and kind of uh, excited about it. Yeah. So that's what kind of. No, they've taken on such a life of their own. Like there's, I'm sorry, you're you're cutting out. You're just saying like a taking a. I think, 
Life of their Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just saying that they've taken on a life of their own. Like they're very emblematic of like social media activism and they're just so iconic and so powerful and they're just so familiar and they're just very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. Amazing. So uh, that was my final question. Um, pivot to Q and A. Okay. If there were any any questions and answers from the audience, I know Aaron was going to step in. Hey everyone. Yeah. Thank you guys for like such an incredible talk. It's it's always nice just to like dive in deeper and. Um, hear everyone's practice from their own voices. I feel like I always discover something new. Mm -hmm. um, we have quite a few questions, so I'm just gonna kind of go through them. Um, the first question is actually from someone named Jay. Uh, what are some of the major gatekeepers in terms of art world access and how do we keep opening those gates? It's a pretty big question, but if anyone's brave enough to answer, <laughs> feel free to hop in. <laughs> I, was, I mean, for sure, I feel like it's like those, oh, sorry, for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I just meant to say, I mean, for sure, it's like those, you know, blue chip 1%, you know, white male run and powered, you know, art spaces, the Gagosians, the Zwerners, the Paul Kasmans, the David Kordanskis. Um, Those are the obvious ones, but you know, I'm just, it's funny, with all these conversations, we don't need gatekeepers, we need gay openers. And this was a, this was a term that's really Bautista Carolina, she's the Met, she's in the book, she's also on the cover. One of her peers, I forget her name, but her one of her peers uses this term a lot. Um, it's about gay openers and aligning with gay openers. And, you know, these gay openers are beginning to look like us. And it's also building separate tables and our own tables. Like, it's like this push pull of like, you know, the art world is like this unregulated billion dollar market and white people hoard all these powerful positions throughout the entire art ecosystem from like the boards, you know, being, you know, from the boards at the top to social media manager. And those positions are occupied by black and brown because museums are scrambling to acquire black and brown artists and colorists from, you know, artists to their roster because won't be woke and to show, you know, show this level, to show this performative level of like, you know, being corporate and being woke. Um, so, but I do feel that black and brown folks should occupy, you know, should be at Christie's, should be at Sotheby's, should be social media managers at, at, at the, you know, at, at Gagosian and, and, and David Swerner and the housing and worths of the world. Um, but again, it's the residency art gallery, it's Richard Beavers, it's Band of Vices. I'm more invested in that, in that kind of those conversations. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, to your point, what has been really interesting in light of last summer, and um, you know, obviously not only like a national and global outcry, I think for change, but you know, this very internal art world um, cry for change. I feel like some of those mega galleries that you've named have, you know, um, shifted their programming and their staff uh, in certain ways. And I'm, I'm just very curious to see like how that pans out over time, you know, what that looks like because um, yeah, you know, it's the question of are these, uh, like fundamental changes, right? That will affect the core of the programming and the gallery system and the market, um, or are these, you know, things that are set in place, um, you know, that ultimately don't add up to something. So I think that's sort of the lingering question. Um, does anyone else want to respond to that? I mean, um, I would just say also just on like, um, kind of like just more on a grassroots or just kind of like uh, like if you're an artist you know trying to uh, be heard or seen I think that supporting spaces that support you and developing those spaces and not worrying about you know like trying to land at a slick gallery with 
beautiful. I mean, yeah, that's good and everything, but it's like developing and helping um, other, you know, kind of like Jasmine was saying, other spaces that um, do speak um, or represent you in with that language, I think is supporting them in any way you can. And, um, you know, and also just kind of like moving along with them and growing with them and, and, and understanding what they're, they're about, uh, supporting them like you would another artist, um, that can speak volumes later on. I mean, it, it's it's something that I that I've uh, you know kind of invested in, and I think that um, you know people come into the art kind of world thinking, or they want to land somewhere like you know really, you know, the optics are really great, but. Um, I think there's something to be said about putting in work on the ground level and staying there and working a little bit, you know, and so it's, it's still a work in progress and, and I'm, I'm down to work. Mm. Um, I wanted to actually ask a question. I have a question for you, Jasmine, before we get into other questions, you know, I think, um, when I received the book, which was like such a joyful moment to your point, you know, I feel like the book coming out during the pandemic, um, it was just like this beautiful surprise that I got to sit with and like enjoy, you know, over the afternoon and just like see all the homies, you know, in these beautiful portraits. And um, I, I found it really meaningful actually that you chose to include LA folks in the book because, you know, of course, obviously you're from New York. It is very New York centric. Um, but I think for me, that really spoke to, uh, you know, the moment that we're in and how, you know, the LA art scene is really blossoming and, you know, really, um, I think, is, is a centerpiece, I think, to this art ecosystem that we're in at this point. Um, and to see all of the folks you featured, you know, is such a beautiful culmination of, I think, the many years that, you know, so many of us have been on the ground doing this work. Um, and so I was just curious, um, you know, yeah, why is it that you decided to, to include this uh, West Coast co cohort? And, you know, what does that mean for you, obviously, as someone who, travels around um, seeing art, you know, like what was it about LA and the LA arts community that really spoke to you? I've only been to LA a handful of times, maybe just three or four times, um, but that was just enough to see the enormity of everyone's work, see the immensity of everyone's work. You know, what I love most, I, I, you know, obviously all super close-knit art communities are close-knit and, and are very intimate, but there's a specialness to the LA art community and I'm not immersed in it, but I've gone a few, I've, I've gone just a handful of times. I follow enough folks to know and to see and to feel that love. And I was, as I was mentioning to Patrick earlier, like there's a synchronicity, you know, that I've noticed between him and, and the folks at, at Charlie's James, but just across the board, you know, half, as, as far as there's a part of that, um, Lauren Halsey is a part of that. Um, just, just so many phenomenal folks are a part of that. I, EJ Hill is a part of that. Um, I see it, I feel it, you know, from my phone screen, following all of you for so many years on Instagram. I feel it, I see it, I love it. I wanted to celebrate it. Many of you have only met maybe just once or twice. I still have never met Gabriela. I still have never met Jay Lynn. I still haven't met Rafa Esparza, who's not in the book, but, um, but you know, obviously it's still a part of, of your community. Um, I, I just, um, I didn't overthink anything, um, but LA was absolutely vital. Um, it's a city that just could not be, it could not be ignored. Um, the, it just, the book would not have been complete. So that LA power, that LA representation, those strong LA voices, um, black and brown voices were just um, palpable, phenomenal and just powerful to include. It was very obvious to me. It just, the, the book would not be complete. And if there's another book, cause hopefully this, this can be a series. It shouldn't be a one and done where it's like, oh, the, this one book that came out in 2021 because of all the shit that happened in 2020. like. This is an ongoing, lifelong perm. There's going to be Gen Z, black and brown kids coming up. They're already coming up. Uh, and they're going to come into their 20s in the 2020s. So hopefully, you know, the, this documentation, you know, can continue in a series. But yeah, but LA is always, has always been a part of it in my mind. 
So it was essential to capture it. And <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I and you know to your point about a series, I think that that's so important too because you know what I said earlier in the introduction is like this is not only a book that features folks, it's really a working archive, you know, of um, the black and brown folks who are, you know, making waves, I think, in this space. Um, the next question is from Colony. Uh, can you each talk about one person who has helped guide or inspire your practice? How are you paying that forward to younger artists looking to start a career in Los Angeles? Genevieve? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go. <laughs> I would say, I mean, maybe it's too obvious, but I would say Arthur Lewis. Um, not only just like, I, you know, I, I consider him a mentor, um, someone that's kind of showing you kind of like all sides of the art world you know we're kind of you know that might be his own knowledge or just like bringing all of us together so we can feed off each other and learn a lot um and just like creating a safe space to um maybe just you know be yourself but also seeing your work and how on the walls of their home and just like seeing you know you could show up there and meet like a hero of yours and you're just like whoa how are you like here right now or how am I here more like it um <laughs> and yeah I think that's one of the many people that's kind of helped me on my journey essence um I'm curious about you and then also this additional question or how are you paying that forward to younger folks who are starting oh, to sorry, I didn't add that. Sorry. I'm not helping anyone out. It's just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> the artist way, Genevieve. No, I'm messing around. I, I mean, hopefully other artists out there feel like I, you know, give back in a way. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is like when I do, you know, studio visits or I mean, a lot of these have been on Zoom. So just kind of remembering what it was like when I was in school, not always getting the feedback or the perspectives that I needed. And so just kind of having conversations and kind of bringing up things that maybe they, other students like don't hear about their work when they're in that space. Um, and always kind of ending it with that reminder if like if you if you're still struggling and you're, you're not getting the feedback that you want and whatever I'm saying resonates then don't hesitate to reach out and not everyone's willing to do that and you know not all of them follow through but I try and just make myself as accessible as you know within reason and also just be kind of upfront and honest with my experiences and just um just like reminding them that we've all kind of gone through that is the best example I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> They're fantastic answers, Jen. Um, <laughs> let's see, you know, I always say Lee Rayford, who's like a professor at UC Berkeley, because she's the first person who taught me a class about like black visual culture when I was an undergrad there. And Lee has become, you know, like my advisor and we collaborated at the exhibition at CAM, the plumb line one about Charles White. And like, man, I don't know, Lee just really holds it down for me in a way. She is not necessarily a curator by trade, but the way that she thinks through the theoretical underpinnings when it comes to blackness, I just find it absolutely helpful. And because she's a teacher, you know, like there's this other component when it comes to thinking about, um, the, you know, the programming or like what the exhibit, how the exhibition can live to whatever degree. And I have plenty of curators who I think are 
deeply generous and kind and I can stare at Aaron all day and think about how Aaron's helpful and useful, my million text messages. Um, there is something about my relationship with Lee who's known me since I was 23 years old um, <laughs> that I find extremely thoughtful and helpful and, you know, like it or lump it, like she's my mentor and I love to bully her about that. Or I'm like, it's just, it is what it is, um, but also a friend. And so like, I, I think that the way that our relationship has developed, you know, is such a guidance for me to think about like, you know, people will reach out and be like, oh, like it's my first show. Like, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure. For, I, I just am, I feel easy enough to have a conversation with anyone really if they reach out to me and I can look at my email in the right moment and reply and then, you know, set up like a phone call or if whatever it needs to be. I think that's a, a real way I try to be as open um, and honest about the process of doing all of this work is because it's certainly not easy and it's fairly bizarre, um, especially because if that's not your background, you know, like if your parents are in that kind of game, it can feel really weird. Like my mom's a meter maid, you know what I mean? Like the, it, you could just be like, I don't know who to go to for these kinds of um, questions around career in this particular sense. And so I try to do that kind of stuff. Also, I just always want to include people who are like way younger, you know, like John Rebus. I think John's like, John's young. <laughs> John's John is like, it's like, God damn, you know what I mean? But like, I love John and I want to think about his work, you know, along someone who, you know, is, you know, my age, which is like, I'm 37, right? So I, I, I really want to, create a world where younger folks are in conversation and exhibitions with people who are older than them and that we're taking seriously people and their craft and if you if you're at the level that you know obviously like working for years and years but i just feel like everyone's been so generous with me and my early ideas like patrick didn't have to be in my first show he could have been like i don't know what the fuck this is like i don't want to do this you know what i mean but he did it and he and he allowed himself to, to enter a conversation with me with other people and to be new and even though i wasn't you know 20 i was new to that and i think that kind of energy and spirit just kind of guides me always and i think that that's something that i did learn you know teaching for a number of years and having someone really guide me about how to like be a proper scholar, um, but also how to think, you know, more broadly about, you know, kind of being like a black person in this world and how to like do right and act right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I have two more questions. Um, this next one is from Elsa. How did the pandemic uh, shut down or affect your practice? Or I'm sorry, how did the pandemic and shutdown affect your practice? Did it generate new ideas? Do you think it changed anything in terms of the art world and access? I guess I'll go again. Um, I get, I've had this question before, so I feel like it's, it's a weird thing to say that it didn't affect me, like in the sense it didn't affect my practice because I'm kind of like in my own space, not with a lot of people around necessarily to create what I create. Um, but I'm kind of making work that's in response to current events. So it's like, we're all kind of, you know, just watching the world crumble and, you know, I'm just kind of gathering those experiences just like everyone else and filtering it through me and putting it out as, as my art. And hopefully that then adds to like a positive change. But um, in terms of my actual practice, it didn't really keep me from creating where I know some people couldn't access the things they needed to make the, what they do um and I think it was also it's like a learning lesson to kind of shift like if you still feel that passion to like create like and you have to like you know I focused more on my collage works because that's what I can do on my own um 
those kinds of things just like make the shift happen so similar to like what Patrick said like this is how we communicate this is our voice and so just like figuring out whatever the materials are that you have access to to still create and like express your voice through that was there a second part to that question um yeah it was about art world and access do you think it changed I mean, it was, I'm weird for, I think a lot of us, I think I was freaking out. I was just like, are people going to buy art anymore? Um, and I, you know, and I know everyone's kind of at a different level, but I was surprised that like, for the most part, like sales were still kind of fairly consistent. Um, collectors were just kind of going shifting modes and just being like, I'm just going to buy stuff based off what I see on a PDF or, you know, and I think a lot of them already do that, um, especially if they know the history of the artist and kind of maybe have a relationship with them or connect with them. Um, it makes it a little bit easier, but I think a lot of um, the way people buy art shifted by just like not really experiencing it in person. And even myself, I, I made a point to buy work um, by young artists that were posting that they needed help and, you know, needed money. And so it seemed like a no brainer to just kind of take or take a risk and just like buy and help somebody out. And I was really pleasantly surprised with the purchases I made. And I think even some of us created things that were more accessible in terms of a price point. Um, Patrick again like putting out the the yard signs and just like keeping that as like a just making the message accessible even though we're kind of on this path of you know selling the art to make a living I think we're really passionate about the message at the end of the day not necessarily the paycheck Yeah, I mean, I'd like to just speak quickly about the access question. Um, I think a few things happened during the pandemic that um, I hope opened up the art world a bit more. I think one thing that I found really compelling was, you know, obviously in response to, um, you know, I think all of these bail funds and organizations that were coming to the forefront at the time of, um, you know, the uprisings and the protests last summer, there were so many different artists and art organizations that were stepping up to create these, um, you know, these, these prints. And um, I found this really compelling because it was a moment in which, you know, Genevieve, to your point, people were thinking about access and price points. And, you know, obviously we're thinking beyond a sort of quick transaction um, in hopes of supporting an organization. And my hope is that that moment actually opened up the idea of acquiring artwork to so many more, um, to so many more folks of color and um, yeah, I'm curious to see if that moment was sort of a pivotal moment in, in opening that. I think also to your point, Genevieve, the fact that, you know, um, gallerists and artists had to totally rethink how to sell work. Um, and so, so much was in the digital realm. So much was, you know, through PDFs or sort of, uh, virtual tours and things like that. And, um, I, I know that for a fact, you know, the fairs, the art fairs um, in an attempt to address this, I think were um, lowering some price points in terms of access. And so I think for many, perhaps this was the first time that they were attending a fair, even if it was virtually. So I, I hope that, you know, that moment sort of continues on and opens up a bit more. Um, okay, we have one more question. Uh, this is from David Kim. I love seeing the art world slowly starting to open up for black and brown folks. Do you see, know of, or have ideas or thoughts of the same or seen something similar for Asians in the arts? Uh, 
Uh, um, I can jump in. Um, I see it. it it's happening. Um, many of those, a lot of AAPI folks are in the book, Hanko, Katie Pevanito, um, et cetera. Oh, Natalie Cates, who co-owns Latchkey Gallery um, in New York City. It's happening. I, I believe one of the um, co-founders of, of var various small fires may be an Asian woman, I, I believe so. Um, of course it's gonna happen. Um, we'll see it in exhibitions. I mean, Anna Park, you know, is a young AAPI artist who she created the artwork for the film Bank and then has a solo show downtown. Um, it will happen. Um, see, my thing is, because I'm always a low key pessimist, um, you will have white folks with power in the art world who again, to be woke, will, you know, add Asian artists to their roster, um, you know, give folks, give Asian folks solo shows. Um, it's gonna be slightly performative. There may not be no genuine, you know, interest there. We'll see how this decade plays out because folk, white folks were really called to task, you know, in 2020 and we will continue demanding and, and Asian voices really have become front and center and much more demanding, you know, we, with, with the obvious, you know, Asian hate that we've seen, which is, um, which is horrific. Um, we'll see how this decade plays out. But yeah, of course I see Asian artists uh, and curators and cultural producers coming to the, you know, to the forefront um, and becoming much more visible alongside black and other non-black POC artists, of course. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. I think that's already happening. And, um, you know, for me sort of thinking globally, um, I have actually seen, there have been so many new galleries and even museum spaces that have been popping up in various um, areas in China. Um, and I feel like globally, China is very much like a, a centerpiece to um, I think where a lot of practices are, um, you know, emerging practices, but also historical practices are, are being featured. Um, and I think a lot of that is actually trickling over to America. And so I'm noticing that there are a lot of American art spaces that are latching on to these Chinese artists. Um, so there's some sort of synergy there that's happening um, Jasmine, to your point about very small fires, Esther Kim um, is one of the co-owners of that space. Um, there's also, I think, you know, there's so many, maybe not so many, but there are some prominent galleries in Los Angeles, um, such as also Common Council, mm -hmm. um, that are, you know, owned, directed, managed by Asian folks. So, um, I think I've seen that throughout the years, actually. Um, and yeah, I, I can only hope that that continues to grow. Um, okay, so I think that was the last question. Um, thank you, Essence, Genevieve, Patrick, and Jasmine for your time. As you can <laughs> see, the setting on my face, so we're gonna <laughs> Um, Jasmine, where can we buy your book? Oh, you can buy it at the Hammer. Um, <laughs> but you can also support, you know, BIPOC bookstores, Reparations Club in LA. Um, it's uh, at Cafe Con Libros in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. It's at the Lip Bar in the BX. Um, but it's everywhere. It's wherever books are sold. I mean, don't make Jeff Bezos richer. So please support, um, you know, Black booksellers. Esther Wan Books as well in LA. So please support Black booksellers. But yeah, the book is everywhere. And thank you so much for supporting because I know it's a pandemic and it's not a necessity, but it can be an enrichment if you find it. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank oh, you. That's right. Semicolon. Semicolon books in Chicago. Yes. Yes, yes definitely. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. Really appreciated hearing from all of you. Again, it's, you know, it's funny. I know all of you so well, but I feel like this pandemic and this time away is just like really refreshing and nice to like yeah. work. So thank you for that time. Um, shout out to the Hammer team, our tech team, our programs team for putting this event together tonight. And please go out and get this book. It's really, it's just really beautiful. Honestly, it's hopeful um, in a time that feels really precarious. Um, and yeah, thank you all and have a great night.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone.